First reading from God's word from Deuteronomy 8. The Lord God reminds the Israelites as they're about to enter into that land of Canaan and take possession of it. He wants them to remember where their blessings are coming from. They're coming from God. And that's what the Lord would like us to remember as well with the many blessings that we have in our lives. Where do they come from? They come from God, who gives us the abilities, the talents, and skills that we have. It says, Then you will eat, and you will be filled, and you will praise the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Be very careful so that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and ordinances and his statutes that I am commanding you today. When you eat and are satisfied and you build nice houses and move into them, and your herds and your flocks multiply and your silver and gold increase, and everything that you have prospers, watch out so that your heart does not become arrogant and forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt where you were slaves. Do not forget the Lord who led you in the great and terrifying wilderness where there were venomous snakes and scorpions, where the thirsty ground had no water. But the Lord made water come out of a flint rock for you. Do not forget the Lord, who in the wilderness fed you manna, which your fathers had not known before, to humble you and to test you, so that it would be good for you later on. You might say in your heart, My ability and the power of my hand have earned this wealth for me. But then you are to remember that the Lord your God is the one who gives you the ability to produce wealth, to confirm his covenant that he promised to your fathers with an oath, as he does to this day. It is God's word. We'll continue with Psalm 73, and Psalm 73, especially that refrain, really hits home with all the tragedy that has happened these past few days there in, was it Waukesha or Wauwatosa? I forget which one. Waukesha, with the tragedy that has happened there in our own home state, in our own backyard. We remember who it is that we trust in and who it is that is our stronghold in these tough times.
Second lesson is from Philippians chapter 4, and here there's a powerful sentence where Jesus tells us, with Christ, you can do all things. I rejoice greatly in the Lord now that you have revived your concern for me once again. Actually, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I lack anything. In fact, I have learned to be content in any circumstances in which I find myself. I know what it is, is to live in humble circumstances, and I know what it is to have more than enough. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, while being full or hungry, while having plenty or not enough. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you did well by becoming partners with me in my affliction. You Philippians know that in the beginning of your experience with the gospel, when I left Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. Even while I was in Thessalonica, you sent help more than once for my needs. Not that I am seeking a gift, but I am seeking the fruit that adds to your account. I have been paid in full and have more than enough. I am fully supplied since I have received from Epaphroditus the things that came from you, a sweet-smelling fragrance, an acceptable sacrifice well-pleasing to God. And my God will fully supply your every need according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Please stand for our gospel lesson. <clears throat> From Luke chapter 17, a familiar account of one who was sick came back and said, Thank you. Often overlooked, we ask Jesus for help, we ask Jesus for comfort, we ask him for forgiveness and this and that. Sometimes we just simply forget to say, Thanks. On another occasion, as Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, he was passing along the border between Samaria and Galilee. When he entered a certain village, ten men with leprosy met him. Standing at a distance, they called out loudly, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. As they went away, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. He fell on his face at Jesus' feet, thanking him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus responded, were not ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Was no one found to return and give glory to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, get up and go on your way. Your faith has saved you. It is the word of our Savior. Please be seated. <clears throat> so we'll continue with him 610, a nice little prayer.
The uh, book of Philippians was written by Paul. And the book of Philippians is considered one of Paul's prison epistles. And it's considered a prison epistle because he wrote it while in prison. In fact, during this time of writing this book of Philippians while in prison, Paul had spent a lot of time in prison. It started there in Jerusalem when the Jews incited this riot, and Paul was taken as a prisoner to Caesarea, and he spent a many long time there in jail in Caesarea before he finally appealed to Rome. He was transferred to Rome where he was in house arrest for two years, chained to a Roman soldier. While he was chained to that Roman soldier in house arrest for two years in Rome alone, you can only imagine what Paul was thinking. He was sitting there in Rome as a prisoner waiting to find out whether he would be executed, set free, or thrown in to the dungeon. That would probably be a mood killer for a lot of people. As he was waiting to find out his fate. A little nervous, a little anxious, perhaps a little angry that he had come to this and he had been sitting there for two years years chained to the soldier. But then to add on to Paul's personal struggles, in our letter from the Philippians, we learned that there was an issue inside the church at Philippi. Two prominent members, two prominent lady members had gotten into a little tangle and were upset with each other and it was causing problems in that church in Philippi, as you can only imagine. And so now this problem got shipped to Paul hundreds of miles away while he is in prison waiting to find out his fate. Paul, deal with this. We don't, we don't care that you're waiting to see if you're going to be killed or not. That's just a little bit of the background for this letter of Paul's to the Philippians. And with that little bit of background, it can really, really make these words that Paul is about to share with us seem really out of place and perhaps put a lot of life in perspective. The words come to us from Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything but in everything. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. From man in prison, waiting to see if life or death or more prison was his fate. From a man in prison who on top of his own obstacles, struggles, and pressures now got the privilege, we'll call it, of dealing with a congregation's issues. And what does Paul say? Leave me alone. Let me wallow in misery. Let me feel bad for myself. No, what did Paul say? Twice he said it, so it becomes emphatically clear. Rejoice. I'll say it again. He says, rejoice, people who are struggling. Rejoice, Paul, myself, as I sit here in prison. Why on earth could Paul in his situation say rejoice? Why on earth could Paul, while dealing with 
the problems at the church in Philippi, could he tell them even in the midst of this division and discord that was going on, tell them to rejoice? He could tell them and he himself could rejoice because of what the Lord had done for them and him. They could rejoice because of what Jesus Christ had made them. They could rejoice because the Lord was near. They could rejoice because the Lord of heaven and earth himself invited them to bring their prayers and petitions and requests before them. They could rejoice because of the peace that God Almighty freely gives. Rejoice always. If you were in Paul's shoes, is that how you would be feeling? Would those be the emotions that you would encourage other people to have, that you yourself would have if you were sitting there in prison? I don't study Roman history very much, but I know Roman soldiers weren't the nicest or the best-smelling people in the world, and you were chained to him for two years straight. Is rejoicing how you would be feeling as you wait for some emperor who thinks he's a god to decide your fate? Be hard. But you're not Paul, so you don't have to worry about it. You're not in prison yet, and hopefully never. But the life that you live right now, the real life situations that you are going through and experiencing this day, this past week, the upcoming weeks and months and years ahead, can you rejoice always in the Lord? Just for funsies, I, I found out from October 2020 to October 2021, inflation has gone up six point something percent. Uh, the news says it's at its highest level in 30 years, uh, and it doesn't appear to be on the downward trend. And what that does is it affects every single one of us because it makes the prices of most everything go up. It makes that green dollar bill in your pocket worth a little less. And you know what that can do to a family? You know what that can do to a young couple? It can add a lot of stress in their life as they're trying to provide for their family and plan for the future. Rejoicing as that income stays relatively the same but prices go up, is that your natural reaction? Praise the Lord. Five dollars for gas. Thank you, Jesus. Is that what you do? Or think about your relationships. Because we have the sad, because we have the sad state, I'm hoping God's going to give me a better example. Come on. <laughs> think about your relationships. Because we, <laughs> our, our, because our perfection was ruined by Adam and Eve, none of us can adequately and truthfully say, yes, our relationships are always perfect. Husband and wife are always getting along. Boyfriend and girlfriend are always honky-dory. And children and, and parents are always kosher. No, there is struggle inside those relationships. There are hostilities at times in those relationships. There are pressures from outside forces or even from inside that family 
that can make that family life at times unbearable in thinking it's going to finally break. And as you're going through that moment in your life with your spouse or your children or whomever, is there that rejoicing in what the Lord has done. Or perhaps it's just health issues, or perhaps it's mental health issues, or perhaps it's anxiety, worry over all the uncertainty of everything that's going on. Can you leave your house anymore without thinking you're going to die? These thoughts, they can consume you. These fears, can overtake you. And what these very real life situations that you experience, that are yours, that are not mine, that are not your neighbors, but are your own personal struggles, pressures, and stresses, what they can do is they can cloud out by making you focus on the very real issues at hand and cloud out the fact that you have a very loving, kind, powerful God who cares deeply about you. That is the danger. Just like in that Old Testament reading from the book of Deuteronomy, you and I can forget. That's dangerous. Here again from Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Why? Why could Paul tell those Philippians? Why could Paul himself have that feeling of rejoicing? His situation was daunting and overwhelming, yet he could still rejoice. And again, you and I, with our very own personal issues and struggles and pressures and obstacles, we ask the same question, why can we rejoice always? Because the truth that was for Paul and those people in Philippi is the truth that is for you and I today. From Daniel chapter 12, at that time, your people will be delivered and everyone who is found written in the book. That is why you and I can always rejoice. You and I can always rejoice like Paul because Jesus Christ had come into this world. You and I can rejoice because Jesus Christ himself has promised us deliverance. You and I can rejoice because Jesus Christ himself has written our names in that book of life. It is truly a reason for us to always have a smile and a happy heart Because that blood of Christ has purified us from all our sins. When he hung there on Golgotha, giving up his very last breath, he enacted a monumentous change in our lives. Before that, our sins were stuck to us and going to condemn us. But after he gave up his one life, that sacrifice on the cross, he set you free. Purified you. And washed you clean. So that your sins, whatever they may be, so that your disobedience, whatever it may be, 
so that you could know without a shadow of a doubt that it has been washed away forever in his precious blood. Jesus himself tells us as far as the east is from the west, that is how far he has removed your sins from you. That is why you can rejoice. Because the sins that we're going to condemn you are yours no more. As it said in Daniel 12, your name is written in the book of life. Because of your Savior, Jesus Christ, you get to look forward to that joyous kingdom of heaven. Because of Jesus, what you get to have in heaven is peace. You don't have to wonder as you leave your house, will I come back? You don't have uncertainty there in heaven. I'm not a big shopper, but I've been to the stores lately, and maybe it's because of my age. I'm used to store shelves being overstocked and surplus of stuff falling on the floor. That's not the way it is anymore. And so another wonderful picture that you and I get to have of heaven is a place of abundance where things don't run out, where you can get a turkey, where you can get whatever you need. That is what Jesus Christ has done for you. And that is the ultimate reason why you can rejoice because come what may to you in your life, the stresses, the pressures, and the obstacles, you know that God's kingdom is waiting for you and that it is yours because Jesus Christ himself made it yours. There's a few other things in these verses from Philippians chapter 4 that might be good for us to look at with all that has happened. It says this, four words, the Lord is near. Who is the Lord? You can think of two pictures with the Lord. He is the one who speaks and things just happen. He is the one who knits your very bodies together in your mother's womb. He is the one who caused fire to fall down on Sodom and Gomorrah for their sinful, rebellious ways. He is the one who killed kings because he said their time is up. He is the one who slaughtered 185,000 Assyrian soldiers because the time was not right for Jerusalem to fall. You can think of the Lord as that powerful angry, vengeful God, and you would be right. And what do you know about this Lord? He is also your loving, heavenly Father. You have in this world, with all the fears and struggles that are about to come upon us or are coming upon us, you have that almighty God in your corner who can stop nature from acting and snuff out a life like that. He is near, Jesus says, to you. And he is watching over you. And he will not leave you. And he will fight your battles for you. And he says, you can do all things through me. That loving, powerful Lord. He can calm a nervous heart and a worrying brain with the peace that only he himself can bring, whether in vengeful power or in a loving, gentle whisper. He can do it. You can rejoice because he is there for you. And one other thing. 
do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. That powerful Lord and that loving Lord, he is inviting you, he is asking you, he is begging you, bring your requests, your prayers, your petitions, bring them to him. He wants to hear them. And know that he will answer them in his wisdom, in his love. What causes you fear, take it to him. And let the living, powerful, loving Lord deal with it. Just as he dealt with your sins. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and always give you his peace. Amen.